Good evening. I hope that the week is going well for all of those listeners. You know, two weeks ago I said to you that I didn't want to go back to a week before. I usually speak only about the current week's Parsha. But I forgot to tell you something, so I went back for one vort at the very beginning, and then we moved on to the current sedra. Fortunately or unfortunately, I have to do it again, because there was a vort from the Chassam Sofer that I wanted very much to share with you, because I thought it was very important information, besides the Kedusha and the Divrei Torah, and everything about it, but it was a, such an important clow that he injected into the realm of Asura Beteves that I want to take the minute or two just to tell it to you and share it with you. You see, as I told you, that the reason that we fast on Asura Beteves and Yom Kippur even if it's Shabbos, is because of the words Be'etzem Hayom Hazeh. The word Be'etzem requires that on the actual day of the date. So if Yom Kippur falls out Shabbos, Yud Tishrei, we fast Shabbos. Why? Because it says Be'etzem. Tish above, if it falls out Shabbos, we push it off to Sunday. Asura Beteves, we fast on, if it would fall out Shabbos, we have to fast Shabbos. Just like Yom Kippur, because it says, Be'etzem Hayom Hazeh. Now, it can't fall out Shabbos, because we don't want Hoshana Rabbah to ever fall out on Shabbos, because taking the five Arabos are so important to hit on the floor that it could, our whole calendar, is set up that the first day of Rosh Hashanah could never be on a Sunday or on a Wednesday or on a Friday, the first day of Rosh Hashanah. All because that if it would come out on those days, then Hoshana Rabbah would fall out Shabbos and it would be muksa to take the five Aravos and hit it on the ground. Says the Chassam Sofer that we know that many times, even though it could never come out on Shabbos, Asura Batavis, but it could come out on Friday, as it did this past week. And we fast on it, we go into Shabbos. And he said, and this is what I want so much to share with you, that the rule is on Asidus, future events, you fast Shabbos. And he brought a raya, that if somebody wakes up Shabbos morning, and he has a terrible dream. He had a terrible dream Friday night. So we know there's such a thing called hatovas chalom, that the person stands up in front of three people and he says over, he asks, and there's a Loshan looking to uh, Rabbi Yaakov Yavitz, into his sitter, Yaakov Emden, you look at his sitter, he has the nusach for being metav, transforming a potentially dangerous happening of a dream into good. But what happens if the person wakes up Shabbos morning and he doesn't have three people? So he has to fast Shabbos. I, what about COVID Shabbos? He's not making Kiddush, he's not having a Suda. COVID Shabbos, Oneg Shabbos. But says the Chassam Sofer, because the dream that he had, he's worried that it's going to happen in the future. Asura Beteves, the Medrash says, every year on Asura Beteves, there is a Bezdin in Shemayim that gets together to decide if that summer, six months later, 
will be Tisha B'Av or not? Meaning that will there be the Geula this year? Or are we going to still have another Tisha B'Av? Says the Chassam Sofer, because it's the future. Like the dream that the person has that's bad, it's about what's going to happen. Tisha B'Av we fast because of what happened, not what's going to happen. Asara B'Teves, it's decided in Shemayim every year, will there be a Tisha B'Av and still Golos that upcoming year? And since it's on Asidus, it's on the future, we fast whichever day it comes out, just like if we had a bad dream on Shabbos, we would fast that Shabbos unless we have a Bezden to be native and to improve the status of whatever we dreamt by a Bezden saying a Nusuch, the three people saying to you the Nusuch of Rabbi Yaakov Emden Siddur and being mate of the Cholom. So that's a very important rule because of the Asidus, says the Chassam Sofer. So that was something I wanted very much to share with you last week, but because I didn't have the time, I didn't say it. But I think it's an important Yisod and the Goinus of the Chassam Sofer, who doesn't need any approbation or Haskama from anybody, but that's his chiddush bringing the raya from the fasting on Shabbos because of the future concern. Now, this week's sedra is the only sedra in Chamisha Chum Torah that there is no hefsik between the last sedra of Vayigash and the words of Vayechi Yaakov this week's parsha. If you take a look in a Sefer Torah, any Sedra you want, you will see that when the preceding Sedra finishes, there's different amounts of space for some Sedras and for others. But there's always a space that takes place. And in Vayechi, after Vayigash, it goes straight into Vayechi without even room for one letter to be written between the last word, the last letter of Vayigash, and the first letter of Vayechi. It's like a continuous co continuation. And the Chazal say, the Medrash talks out that because it's sosum, it's closed, it's like hidden, there's no room for anything to be written. It goes straight into the next word. Why? Because Yaakov Avinu, as I've said to you, represents Mayrev, darkness, Golos. And when you have no room for a letter, that means you have no room for an understanding or an explanation. And Golos has produced for Klal Yisrael so much, so many unanswered questions. People are always asking, how could the Holocaust have happened? How could this happen to Klal Yisrael? So much massacre, so much death, so much suffering. And the truth is we do not have the answer because we are not looking from behind the curtain and understanding why this neshama had to go through this and why this had to happen to that person. We don't have any of the answers. That's called hastama, that's called hidden. And that's why when Yaakov Avinu came to his Petira and he gathered his 12 sons, as soon as they came together, he wanted to be Megala to them when Mashiach will come, when the Gula Shalema will happen, the Nistimu Eneim Shel Yisrael, HaKodesh Baruch Hu took away his Ruach HaKodesh and said, you're not going to discuss it. And the Arm of Fortune who said, it wasn't just that he wanted to tell them when Mashiach will come, 
but he wanted to actually bring Mashiach. Bikesh Yaakov legalos es haketz, they teach, that he wanted to reveal the actual geula, because he saw what's going to be for the next 2,000 years till Mashiach comes, the suffering, the pain, and everything that they have to go through, and he wanted to cut it short. But HaKadosh Baruch Hu immediately took away his Ruach HaKodesh, and he couldn't say anything or do anything. So that's why the beginning of Vayechi, which even though he wanted to reveal everything, but he could not do it, and it remained a secret and a puzzle for Klal Yisrael why things were going to happen throughout the Golos until Mashiach comes. Then it's like a light switch that you throw on, and suddenly the dark room in a second becomes completely lit, and you see everything. When Mashiach will come, suddenly we're going to get answers in a second to everything, every problem, every issue, every concern of why this and why that will have all of the answers. Now, the Zohar HaKodr says, Vayechi, we know that Yaakov Avinu, as I told you last week, he lived 130 years out of Eretz Yisrael, uh, in Eretz Yisrael, and then he went down to Mitzrayim for the last 17 years of his life. He had to be Mesachan, as I told you, that the Avos were Mesachan, Odom uh, Arishon Zaveris, that the Avodazara that Odom had, because he listened to the Nochosh and not HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and it was considered the Avodazara, Avram Avinu were not, was knocking down idols all the time, to be, to be misaken and to fix up the blemish of the Avodah Zorah of Adam Rishon. The second thing was the Shvichas Domim, that he brought death to the world, so Yitzhak Avinu was ready to be Makar of himself uh, on the Akedah, which was a ticken for that, for that Shvichas Domim that he brought to the world. And the third and final thing was the 130 years that, uh, that Yaakov Avinu was massacred for Adam Arishon, 130 years of Chatoim. And after those 130 years that he did Shuvah on his Chatoim, he, Yaakov Avinu spent in Tsaris with Lavan, with Esav, and with, with Dina, with all the Tsaris of his life, he spent the 130 years doing during those years of Tsaris was a ticken for the 130 years, and that's why Yaakov Avinu lived for 130 years in Golos, in, I'm sorry, in Eretz before he went down to Mitzrayim. He had to first finish that. But the last 17 years of his life, he went down because when they told him in last week's Seder that Oid Yosef Chai, that Yosef is alive and well, Suddenly his Ruach HaKodesh came back to him, and if you remember the words of the Pasuk, Rav Li Oid Yosef Chai, the Arizal says that there were 288 Chalke Kedusha, chunks of Kedusha that fell into Mitzrayim. Yosef in his lifetime fixed up and elevated back to the source 202, that was the Rav, Reish Beis, 202, Rav Li, Oid, Yosef Chai, that the simple meetings, that, oh, Yosef's still alive. What Yaakov Avinu was saying, says the Arizal, that he brought to life Yosef Chai, the Rav, the 202. But Yaakov Avinu saw that he didn't finish the job with all 288. There were still 86 halakim that had to be elevated and brought back to their source. So he said he had to go down to Mitzrayim to lift up those chunks that Yosef was not able to lift up. 
And that says the Zohar Kodesh, Vayechi Yaakov Be'eretz Mitzrayim, that Yaakov Avinu lived in Mitzrayim, meaning Vayechi Yaakov, that he brought to life in Eretz Mitzrayim those last 86 Chelke Kedusha that had to be uplifted and brought back to their source of Kedusha that he was able through his avoida there in Mitzrayim to bring them back. Now, we know that as soon as he was sick and he felt that he was going to be nifter, he called his 12 sons together and he gave them each a bracha. Now, to Yosef, he gave a bracha, but he also gave to Ephraim and Menashe that for the rest of history, fathers on Rosh Hashanah, fathers on Shabbos, fathers at different times of Yom Tiv, <clears throat> will say to their children, Yesimcha Elohim ke Ephraim v'chim Menashe. The question asked by many is why didn't Yaakov Avinu just choose two of his children? Why did he jump over all 12 children and go to his two grandchildren? I mean, you had tremendous, Yehuda had Malchus, Ruvain had, uh, he was the Bechor. Say, Yesimcha Elohim ke Ruvain v'chi Yehuda. Or Levi had Kahuna, Kahuna Gedola. Say their names. Why say Ephraim and Menashe? So the answer many say is because as true, as big as the Shivte Ka were, and they were Tzadikim Gemurim, the biggest of the big, but they never lived in Mitzrayim. They only at the end of their life, for those 17 years, but they were 100 years old. I mean, uh, uh, Levi was the last of the brothers to be Nifter when he was 116 years old. And they lived their whole lives in Eretz Yisrael. Ephraim and Menashe withstood the test of Golos. They were living their whole lives, Ephraim and Menashe, on 42nd Street. They were living in the middle of Ervas Haoretz, of the Tuma of Mitzrayim, yet they remained Sadikim Gemurim. And that's why Yaakov Avinu saw that in the Golos and in the dark days of exile, that the level of the Shiv Teiko was unbelievable but they didn't live in Mitzrayim and withstand that type of test. So specifically, he wanted Ephraim and Menashe to hold the hand, to be the bestowing factor of everything that would bring to fruition the existence of Klal Yisrael through the Golos. Now, we see that when Yaakov Avinu gave a bracha to the two children of Yosef, to Ephraim and Menashe, Menashe was the Bechor, and he crossed his hand, Sikeles Yodov, that he put his right hand on Ephraim's head, and he put his left hand on Menashe. So Yo Yosef protested and he said to his father, Lo chein ovi, ki amenashe habachor, sim yodcha, you should put your right hand on Menashe's head. And that's why Yo Yosef put Menashe right in front of, Yo of Yaakov, that he should just stretch out his right hand and put his hand on Menashe. But he didn't. He put it on Ephraim. And many, many weeks ago, I shared with you briefly what the, uh, the Arizal says, 
that why was it that when they went into Eretz Yisrael, that Reuven and God remained separate, and Menashe, half of his shevet went in Eretz Yisrael, and half of his shevet remained out of Eretz Yisrael. So I very briefly want to say to you that what I told you then was that Reuven, when Yaakov Avinu was together with Rachel, it wasn't Rachel, it was Leah. So in his closeness with his wife, who he thought was Rachel, he really had a machshava for Rachel, and it was Leah, which is something that husband and wife can't have different machshavas. So because he had that machshava, you see that in the morning he said, that he discovered in the morning that it was Leah. He didn't know it. Rachel was under the bed talking for Leah so that he wouldn't recognize the voice. So, Yaakov Avinu, and from that union, Reuven was born. That was why Reuven couldn't go into Eretz Yisrael. The Pesach says because he needed to pasture the many sheep and the cattle and everything. But this is Alpi Kabbalah, the reason that Reuven could not go into Eretz Yisrael. Now, Rachel had a maidservant called Bilhah, but before she gave Bilhah to Yaakov, she told Yaakov, so Yaakov knew he was going to be with Bilhah. But when Leah took Zilpah, she never said a word to Yaakov, and Yaakov thought he was with Leah. But it was Lamaisa Zilpah. And from that union came out God. So Reuven and God could not go into Eretz Yisrael. Now when Dina had the terrible violation by Shechem ben Chamor, that she had a baby girl, her name was Osnas. So into that girl, we know that every person has the Kedusha or the Tumma of a father and the mother. Dina was complete Kedusha from both her father and her mother. But Leah, but, but, but Shechem, who lived with Dina and they produced a daughter, his half was Tumma. And the other half was, was Kedusha. Now the Kedusha, when Yosef married that girl, that Osnas, that became his wife. And they had Menashe, the half from Shechem, that was in Osnas, went into Menashe. And the other half was from Dina, was Kedusha. But by Ephraim, who was the younger son, both Tzedodim came from Yosef and Osnas, and both sides of Kedusha came. Yosef had only Kedusha, but Osnas had half Kedusha and half Tumah. The half Tumah went into Menashe, the half, other half, the Kedusha, went into Ephraim. Yaakov Avinu saw this when he had to give the eternal bracha to them. Therefore, he put specifically his right hand on Ephraim because he saw that both Sadodim from father and mother were Kedusha. But he saw in Menashe that there was half of his Kedusha from Yosef. But the other half in him was the Tumat side of Osnas, which came from Shechem. And that's why he didn't want to put the hand on Menashe first, even though he said he's going to be very great and very big, but he's not going to be as big as the younger son because he has two tzedodim. So says the Arizal. Now, the, the end of the Sedra 
talks about, I'm going to jump back a little bit. The end of the Sedra talks about the fact that when Yosef's grandchildren had their children, Gam b'nei mocher yuldu al birke Yosef that his great-grandchildren were on his knees, the Pusik says. The Targum Yoinus and ben Uziel says that that's referring to Sandako'os. We know that when a baby is held at his bris, that the tremendous segula of being mamshech kedusha to the child comes from the Sandik. First Tesach, it comes also from the parents, it comes from the moyel. If they took a machal Shabbos to be the moyel, there is a chisarin in how much kedusha it could be that the meal is, is 100% good, but there's levels, and there's levels of kedusha. So if somebody wants to have the best for their newborn child, they should take a sandik that goes to the mikveh, a moil that goes to the mikveh, that they are completely proper b'nei Torah, that their avoida is l'shem shamayim, that they should have in them the qualities which can be transmitted and transferred by their maisa mila, or the holding of the child, by their machshavas, into the machshava of the child. And it has a tremendous effect. So, says the Targum Yonis and Ben Uziel, that there it was a tremendous effect that the children had in being able, after Yosef was nifter, to continue that tremendous power of being able to sustain the level of Kedusha that they had, because Yosef at Tzadik was their moyel. So says the Targum Yonison ben Uziel. Now, we know, for instance, that Sandakos is so big that there's a Shaila in Rishonim that if, let's say, on the day of the bris, you, they're davening together, and there's, they're all Yisraelim, the Moyel, the father of the, the baby, and the Sandik. Who should, become, who should get the third aliyah by Kriya Sator if it's a day that they lane? Who gets that third aliyah? So the, the father is the first in line, but many hold that even before the moyel, the sandik gets the aliyah. Because the sandik koos has in it that tremendous power. That's why if you go to many of the shuls, uh, especially the Svardim, where they daven not just Nusach Svard, but they're Svardim, that after a bris, sometimes there's 200 strangers come in to get a bracha from the Sandik. They don't go to the moil, they go to the Sandik to get a bracha from them because the power of Sandikos is so strong that Rabbi Yehuda HaChosed, who was at the time of the Balei Toisvis, and he was best friends with the Balei Toisvis, and the Balei Toisvis said on him, on Rabbi Yehuda HaChosed, that if he wanted to go into a cemetery and tell everyone to stand out of the graves, they could have, it would have happened. He had the power of Tanoim and Amaroyim, who lived before him a thousand years, 800 years, that he would have had the ability, just like they, to be Machaya Mason. Now he left over, Rabbi Yehuda said many Takonas, and there was a Sefer of 3,000 pages, which explained al Kabbalah every one of his 53 Takonas. And we know that many people say, well, two brothers can't get married. 
Who said that? Rabbi Yehuda HaChosset said it. And he is the one that said that when you travel on a day of travel, you do not shine your shoes. He was the one that said, two sisters and two brothers, if they live in the same city, should not marry. He was the one that said that when you refurbish a house, and if there was an opening to the outside, like a window, and you want to close the window, you must leave the, the amount of a nail, the smallest, tiniest hole, from the inside to the outside, so that mazikim, the devils, the samach mem, that negative power in a house have where to go out from. And many tzaddikim, when people came to them and said they moved in a new house, and their, their people are falling down the stairs, there's trouble in the house. The first question they asked them, did you redo the house? And they said, yes, we refurbished and changed a lot. Did you leave an opening from a room where you had an opening to the outside, a window or whatever, and leave at least the tiniest hole to the outside? Many tzaddikim, and it's brought in Tami Minhogim, that, that Indian. This all came from Rabbi Yehuda HaChosid, and the fear and the reverence given to Rabbi Yehuda HaChosid was so much that the Kotzka Rebbe, who lived 700 years after Rabbi Yehuda HaChosid, the, the Kotzka Rebbe said he wished that Rabbi Yehuda HaChosid would have put into his 53 in Yonim of the Tzava, uh, the words, uh, the Pasuk, Anochi Hashem Elokecha, the Aseris Hadibris. Because said the Kotzka Rebbe that the people, even since then, 700 years later, and it's told today, the Kotzka lived 240 years ago, that today, a thousand years after Rabbi Yehuda HaChosid, people are shaking. So said the, from what every word that he said, that the Kotzker said, because the people were more afraid of his tzavo and he, the things he said to do and not to do, than they were of the Anochi Hashem Elokecha in Parshas Yisro, the Aseris Hadibris. So he wished that Rabbi Yehuda HaChosid would have put the Aseris Hadibris into his tzavo. Because people were more afraid of his tzava than where the Torah in Parshish Yisro it says, Anochi Hashem Elokecha. So the idea being that Rabbi Yehuda HaChosid was very, very, very great. And he, as one of his things in his tzava said, you should never give sandakos to the same person in one family. That means, let's say, a man, his wife gave birth, and he was mechabed somebody with sandakos. And a year or two later, she had another boy, and he wanted to give the same person sandakos. Says Rabbi Yehuda HaChosid, not to do it. That means a person could have sandakos a thousand times, he can have sandakos with different families and different people. But he could, should never in one family give twice the same person. And, and people were very afraid of it and never did it. And that's why the Noide Yehuda, who was the Poisek Hador, at the time when the Baal Shem Tev lived in the Mizritcha Magid, he was the Poisek Hador. And in the beginning, he was fire against Hasidim. But then at the end of his life, he turned around because he saw the tremendous Nisim V'Niflos, the Kedusha, the, the, what was going to end up happening. And, uh, and when there was a Machloikis, there was terrible fire between Misnagdim and Hasidim. 
But the Mizritcher Magid said to his Hasidim, his group, Rabbi Reb Levi Yitzchak of Bartichev, and to the Reb Zushya and the Noyam Eli Melech, to all of them, he said to them, the fact that you wanted to put a cherem on the misnagdim, you've lost me this year. And he was nifter that year of the Mizritcher Magid. But he said, but one thing you got, you lost and you got, you won that every time there's going to be a machloikis in the world between misnagdim and chassidim, the chassidim are going to prevail. They're going to win. And you see 250 years later that the chassidim, I, I'm, I'm not saying chasson, that the misnagdim are, are disappearing, but from, from many of the yeshivas that were in Europe today, there's hardly anything left from them. And, and you see the power of Hasidus, you see what's going on in the world, how Hasidim thrive and how they are such a dominant force all over the world, they're Israel, America, everywhere, in their avoidus Hashem and in their shuls, their yeshivas. So the, the Rabbi Yehuda HaChosid said that there should never be the same person as Sandik in one family. Now we know that somebody wrote a Shaila to the Noida Yehuda, and that was the Shaila. I want to be Machabed somebody with Sandik Koos, but I already gave him five years ago Sandik Koos in our family. Can I do it? And first the Noy de Behuda answers him and says, I don't get into these if it's type of shilas, these esoteric Kabbalah shilas. I only respond to shilas that have a basis in the Mishnayas or in the Gemara. Otherwise I don't address it. But right after he says that, he goes into a three-page tshuva of answering the thing, and he said every Rebbe and every, every Rosh Yeshiva gets in one family, many, we know even today, that a Rebbe could, a man could have 10 sons, and that the Sandik is, is the same Rebbe or the same Tzaddik, that he wants the same person. And we know that the Hasidim are very careful with whatever Rabbi Yehuda Chassid said. So how do they do it? So he said, because it's an elevated position and they don't have to worry about the iron horror and they don't have to, that's what the Noy de Yehuda wrote. But the Hassam Sofa wrote him back a letter because they lived at the same time. And it was a fiery letter of great criticism from the Hassam Sofa to the Noy de Yehuda. And he said, how could you answer that person that he could take the sandik again? The only, the sandik is compared to the Koyen Godel, and the Koyen Godel every day, he was supposed to be Makta the Katoiris, but he used to give it out to different Koyanim every day. Why? Because a Koyen that was Makta the Katoiris became rich. And they wanted to give everyone an opportunity to become rich. So they never gave it to the same koyen. But what if the koyen godel wanted to preempt the koyen and not give it out and every day be mocked to the katoris? It was his. He was allowed to do it. So a Rosh Yeshiva or a Rav has a din like a koyen godel. But for the Hamon and for the Amcha, that's not the case. That's what the Hassam Sofer wrote back in a very fierce lotion and expression to the Noy de Yehuda. So we do not do today Sandakos, not because the Sandak is like the Koyen that's being mocked to the Katoiris and he's going to get rich, and it is, Sandakos is a Segula for Ashiras. Somebody once asked Rabbi Akiva Eger and said to him, Rabbi, I've been a Sandik maybe 40 times 
and I'm an onamaduka. I don't have bread on the table in my house. So the Rabbi Akiva ans Eger answered him and said, because when it says that a sandik becomes rich, it's because it means both sandikos, that he's the sandik holding the baby by the bris. And afterwards, when they say the brachos, he himself, who was the sandik holding the baby, is again the sandik, it's called the sandik me'umad. When another person's saying the brachas and the name of the child, somebody's holding the baby. So that's called sandik me'umad. So Rabbi Akiva Eger said he has to be the sandik me'yushuv and the sandik me'umad. And that's what it's going on, that he'll become rich. But if you're just doing one of the two, you don't become rich. That's what he answered this person. But uh, most of the time you don't have the same person. Um, because you're short on kibudim and you need the extra kibud to go. I had one time in my life, I had a student that wanted me to be the sandik of her child, and I was, and then they called me for sandik ma'umid at the same bris. I once in my life had that occurrence, the schus of being sandik meyushav and sandik moment, and let's hope the segula will kick in one day. <laughs> so that, that's at the end of our sedra. But when Yaakov Avinu brought together the shiv teko, he said, hey, osfu v'yagida lachem eis asher yikra eschem ba'achres hayomim. That I want to tell you what's going to be. So many tzaddikim touch that pasuk. Hey, osfu means gather. V'yagida lachem, and I will tell you. Eis asher yikra, that which will happen. Ba'achres hayomim at the end of days. The geula shlema. So they teach hey also, that when Yidin gathered together with Achdus Yisrael and Avas Yisrael, he was saying that hey also, that getting together and being united with no machloikis, Esa Sher Viagida Lochem. Agida, the word Agida means to tell, but it also means to put together. When we take a lulav, and in Esrig, and Aravos, and Hadassim, it's called Igud. In other words, you can't have in one corner the, the Lulav, and in another corner the Esrig. You have to hold them together. That's called Igud, Aguda, together. So he they teach, hey, also, when you gather together, Ba'achtas, and you are gathered together with egot, one yid to another, Esa sher yikra, how valuable. The word yikra means happen, or it means mayokar chazuch Hashem, as we say in halal. There it means mayokar chazuch, how valuable the, the v'yagida lochem, how valuable Esash, the coming together, how valuable it's going to be, that before Mashiach, the biggest segula is the Simcha and the Avas Yisrael, which will exist by Yidin, to bring about the Geula Shalema. So, um, Like it says in the Gemara, in Sukkah, that Yachol kol ha-koifetz noitel, that means if someone wakes up in the morning and says, yeah, I could run around and give tzedakah or sit down and learn and go feed this old elderly lady who needs help eating, uh, that I could do it anytime I want. No problem, no one's holding me back. So the Gemara says, Yochel, a person may think, Kola koifetz, anyone who jumps up to do a mitzvah, noitel, that he can do it. Talmud lomer mayokar chazuch Hashem. You think you can just do what you want? 
If you're not zoiched to the schos, you cannot do it. You will be held back. You will be stopped from getting the schos. You won't have the opportunity. They won't, min HaShemayim, give you the opportunity. So when a Yid runs around to six sick people and helps them eat, helps them get out of the bed, that's a diamond that Hashem is giving you to be able to have the schus. Because if you're not able to do it, you find some people leave over $14 million to a dog. And when people came to them and asked them for a tzedakah, for a hospital, for an almana, for someone that really could use the money, no, I don't want to give even a hundred dollars. I don't. But they left to the dog fourteen million, because that's what the Gemara is saying. These people were never zoicha; they never were given the opportunity to have the schus and to be able to truly dive in and delve into the realm of having such schusim that in Shemayim it's unbelievable how they react to them because of the schusim. So we have to realize and cherish every opportunity that is thrown our way because before we turn around, we go from 25 and 35 to 85 and 95. And then life has, takes its toll and we move on. So we should relish the mayokar chazdecho Hashem, the value of each and every schus, because some people are able to do the schus, and they're given that gift from Shemayim, and some are not given the schus at all. Now, we know that when Yaakov Avinu was Nifter, after they had 70 days, and I spoke to you on Chas, uh, Hanukkah, that from Yaakov Avinu's Yortzeit, the first day of Sukkot, to the first day of Hanukkah is 70 days. And they had 70 days of mourning, and then they took Yaakov Avinu to Eretz Yisrael, to Ma'or HaSamach Pela. And the, the Oren of Yaakov Avinu, when it came to Ma'or HaSamach Pela, the Gemara in Soita says that the that Esav showed up, that Esav showed up and said, what are you doing? There's Adam and Chava, there's Avram and Sora, there's Yitzchak and Rivka, and Leah is already buried. There's one more place, that's my place. So the, the children of Yaakov said, to Ace of their uncle, you sold it. So the Gemara says that he said to the children, show me a star, show me any document that I sold it to you. So they said, we have the document, but we don't have it with us. That we left it in Mitzrayim. So the Gemara says that they turned to Naphtali, who was a marathon runner, Naphtali, and they said, go back to Mitzrayim and get the document. And he ran back to Mitzrayim and he got the document. But meantime, while he was going to get the document, Ace of was standing there fervent that he wouldn't let anything be, Yaakov be buried till he got back the document. So Chushim ben Don, Don had one son and his name was Chushim and he was deaf and dumb. He was deaf. And he didn't hear the whole conversation about the star. 
So he asked, what's going on? Why isn't our, my grandfather being buried? So they told him in sign language that Asaf is not letting us bury him because he wants to first see the document. So Asa Hushim said, what? My grandfather is sitting here bebizoyan with a zoyan, a, a nifter that's not being buried, it's a bizoyan. And he went and he killed Esav and his head rolled into Ma'ara Samachpela because in the Shoirish, Esav, that's why Yitzhak wanted to give him the bracha, because in Shoirish he was bigger than Yaakov. But it wasn't meant to be. It had to be with Klal Yisrael, not with the Christians. Esav, from Esav came out all the Lahavdal, the Christians. So, but because in Shoirish he was, he, his head had to be in Mara Samach Pela. And he's there. He's today there, not buried there, his body, but his head is in there. So Chushim had only one son, yet we see, Chushim was the only son of Don, yet we see that when they take the misper of the different Shvatim, that Binyamin had ten sons, and Don had only one son, and that the amount of grandchildren and in the Shevet was double the size of Binyamin. And the Mepharshim say that the reason that it was double the size to show Klal Yisrael that you never know the cheshboinus of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That means if we went out on the street today and we found a Yid on the street and we said, Don had one son, Chushim. Binyamin had ten sons. Which shevet do you think ended up bigger? Most people would answer and say, which shevet became bigger? Probably Binyamin. He had ten sons, and he only had one. But if you look at the numbers, Don was the second, after Yehuda, was the second largest shevet. And Binyamin was much, much, almost half the size of Don to show us that we in Olam Hazed do not know the cheshboinus with families and what's going to be. We have to live our lives and seize each hour and each day. As a matter of fact, when we talk about each hour, they ask in the beginning of our parsha, it never says how, about days. It says that Vayechi Yaakov Beretz Mitzrayim Shavai Esrei Shana Vayechi Yemei Yaakov Shnei Chayov. It says, and the days of Yaakov were. What are you talking about? Just say at the end of the Pasuk that it was 147 years that he lived. What are you mentioning the days? So the Mephorshim answer. The Pasuk says, Yemei Yaakov to teach us that not in our lives are just the seminal events the special, we get married to someone, we have this child, we have certain events in our lifetime which we stand out with. But Yaakov Avinu every single day was equal to every year. That he sees the opportunities of life and he never lost the momentum and he never lost the opportunities. Now, with, with Chushim Ben Don, Reb Chaim Shmuel Evid, Sechrona Levrocha, the Mir Rashi Shiva, said, why is it that Chushim Ben Don stood up and for the covet of Yaakov Avinu? The other grandchildren there, they weren't upset that his arm was sitting on the ground and that was ready to be buried in another hour, another hour, another hour, another hour. No one said anything, so asked the mirror Rosh Yeshiva. And he answered, because he did not hear the conversation going on. He was deaf. 
He didn't hear anything. And when people get involved in conversations, it pulls them away from the essence of the issue of the day or the hour or the minute. That means we are lured into discussion sometimes which deviates, we, we are detoured from focusing on the end result of what has to happen and what has to be. And sometimes it's even L'Shem Shemayim. But if you know that the burial has to happen as quickly as possible, we know that you're not allowed to wait with the burial. Somebody says, oh, well, there's two first cousins who live in California, so we're waiting with the Leviya for them to get here to New York. You're not allowed to do that. The primary concern is the nifter. The nifter is a shori bitsar till they're buried. So what do you mean you're gonna have the nifter wait another day or two for two cousins to come from California? The person has to be buried immediately, immediately. And that's how we have to, we have to be choilik. We have to give the proper COVID to the nifter because that has to be our primary concern. But Reb Chaim's kasha of why didn't the other grandchildren stand up for the COVID of that? And his answer is so eye-opening. We get detoured and we deviate from the purpose of our mission, whatever that mission may be, because of something that drags us away, that the Samach Mem has a thousand ways to be able to pull away the person from focusing on what he should be focusing. So we finish this Parsha, we were just saying Barashas Baralokim. We turn around and a minute later we're holding by the Chazak, Chazak, Venis Chazak. And I say to each and every one of you who are listening that we should internalize the Chazak, Chazak, Venis Chazak, as it said, and it should become part and parcel with the enthusiasm and the momentum as we go into Sefer Shemos, the Sefer HaGeula, just like it says, they went into the Shebud, we've been in the Shebud, but the end result was, Uvnei Yisrael, Yoitzim Beyod Ramah.